without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, the new Bennett. disciple and everybody left. <laughs> uh, nice death stroke outfit, brother. <laughs> Good one. Uh, yeah, wow, wow. It's a, it's, it's a really uh, hot performance. <laughs> yeah, just getting started, yeah. And then when I was, I was I'm staying over at the, uh, at the um, Biltmore, which is a Frank Lloyd Wright building, or a guy called called MacArthur built it, and then him and Frank Lloyd Wright had a fallout or something. But I got out this morning and I and, and Kelly LeBrock was in the van. I was riding in there. And all I could think about was that movie. Was a woman in red. Guys, you know what I mean? Woo. Yeah. <laughs> so go get a signature with Kelly and say, Manu sent you. to run it over. So we're gonna go, we're gonna try and go for the uh, full hour. Um, so if you have other commitments, you know, blow them off, because why would you want to be on stage and be right here? Uh, so we're gonna be uh, doing some uh, question and answer. So we have our, so I don't see my people. Oh, there we go, okay, there you go. We have Kate over here, and we have Carolyn down here. So the mics are there and there. So if you guys want to think some questions, start coming up and we'll uh, get you going. In the meantime, I will start the first question, if you don't mind. Go for it. So, um... Kid. <laughs> <laughs> no spoilers. No spoilers, okay? We'll try, but no promises. Uh, so, uh, I'm, I'm a huge Deep fan of, of uh, Arrow and Spartacus and all this stuff, but uh, it was the biggest surprise to me when I was watching the behind the scenes of The Hobbit that suddenly there you were. Like, I had no idea that you were uh, sure. so, It was a surprise to me as well. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I was... I was, uh... Filming Spartacus, and uh, we had this scenario where these Germanic uh, guys were going to come and join our show, and uh, so they cast a whole bunch of guys. You know, on Spartacus, there were people who showed up and then got killed, and then other people showed up and they got killed. And usually, you showed up and you got killed. Uh, but uh, you know, so we had these Germanic guys coming, and uh, somebody said, "Oh, there's this guy coming called Conan, and he's really big." And uh, this guy rocked up, and um, and he was a guy that I went to high school with. <laughs> yeah, like like he'd he he I was on the playground in, when we were like 17, 16, 17 years old, and everyone called this kid Bones because he was like just big and skinny, and he'd walk around. He looked like he'd been bitten by a scorpion or something. It was just like. <laughs> and um, anyway, everyone picked on him, and then one day we were on the playground. We saw this guy from the year above us picking on him in the middle of the playground and suddenly Bones with these big sort of lanky arms just went woof and he punched this guy in the face and the guy fell over or unconscious or not, you know, as unconscious as it gets at high school, you know. <laughs> Which means he just brushed it off and walked away embarrassed. But, uh, but uh, suddenly Bones was born, this guy, you know, and, and, and he went on to, I think he, you know, he, he got a thing about being big and strong and, uh, and went on to become one of the biggest guys in, you know, in my hometown. Um, started working for security, then worked for WWE. He was about to get a WWE kind of contract and then I fell over him. I don't know, but he showed up on our show. Anyway, I had done an audition for The Hobbit and I was still waiting to hear. I was like, oh God, when's the word going to come through? Anyway, Shane came and I said, I'll oh, come over to my house for dinner, mate. We can talk about school in those days. And you know, he, he came to my house and, and during dinner he went, oh, I want to tell you something really exciting. I just got cast as Arzog. <laughs> I mean, I had a fork in my mouth. I was like... <laughs> I, I, you know, I couldn't, I didn't, have the, I didn't have the courage to tell him that I'd auditioned for it as well, but I was like, good on you, Shane. Well, well done, mate. Okay. Fantastic. So he went down and he did this, did this film as Arzog. The, the Hobbit, he filmed it in a big suit. But um, what happened was, if you remember the, uh, the orcs in Lord of the Rings, they were, they had these masks that were just pretty inanimate. 
if you, if you went to an orc's face, it was just going, ah. This was the problem with, with, with using, you know, just pure costuming and, uh, and, and makeup for an orc, because it had this, you know, when you're having to have that sort of structure, it's all, you can't motorize it, you can't move that stuff enough for it to have really good expression. So when, um, when Peter Jackson got to the editing room, he decided it, it just wasn't working. I guess it was a little bit like when they got to the end of Star Wars with David Proust and went, you know, Really? Star Wars! <laughs> that was... That was weird. If that's David Proust, tell him I'm not talking about him. Because, you know, when David Proust did, uh, did uh, Star Wars, you know, his, his American accent, uh, you know, uh, just... Uh, Lucas just was like, oh, it's not working, so they went and hired James Earl Jones to put his booming voice in over the top of the actor's performance. Um, which was something interesting, you know, that, that relates also to this story, because what happens, Peter James had got to this point and he went, it's not working. And uh, so they thought about how they could possibly change what was going on, and they, um, had, they, had, they, could, they had to go through the very arduous task of removing my school buddy's performance <laughs> from the screen. I mean, I felt really bummed for him, you know, but at the same time, it was a huge opportunity for me. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, anyway, so I, I went down there and, and uh, you know, Peter Jackson's decision was to make Arzog, Arzog uh, a, a powerful uh, warrior through CGI. Because he knew, you know, as soon as I got down there, Peter Jackson said to me, listen, you know, your audition, we thought the audition was so strong, but we knew that you could fight because of the Crixus stuff, and, uh, but we really uh, didn't think, you know, we thought we had to go for a seven foot guy, but now that we're just gonna go capture the performance, you're our guy, and we'll make you nine foot, just uh, by stretching the image. Because <laughs> I'm not nine foot. <laughs> I'm just over five foot nine, actually five foot. But um, but yeah, yeah. So, so that was just you know that was a, that was really just a, an incredible turnaround. And uh, you know, doing that process was was something very very unique. Uh, motion capture is a, a a very difficult process. Actually, you know, you have to add so much more to your imagination because nothing's there. Everyone, everybody's gone home who, who did any live action shooting, and you're just in a space where Peter Jackson's saying to me, you know, this is what's going on around you and you're just trying to make it up while you're dressed like a, like a, the gimp. <laughs> and a tight bodysuit with little balls all over you and you, and you don't feel big. I mean, for Andy Serkis to play a reptile, I get it, having that outfit on, you could get <laughs> But being five foot ten and conscious that this guy's meant to be nine foot and you're dressed in, like, you know, Santa's stocking. <laughs> You really got to escape that thing in your head and become you just you just have to believe you're big. And, you know. Did that answer the question? <laughs> Oh, absolutely. You know, I mean, uh, you know, this this is really it's it's not like you know I do a performance and then it just doesn't matter. It's uh, it's not just motion. I mean, uh, there was one point in particular where I was on a wag, you know, you know the giant wolf. So I'm sitting on this wag, which was in the studio. I walked into the studio and there was this pommel horse, you know, like from a gymnasium, and it had green material wrapped over it. It's, it's been green screen, so it'll disappear into the, into the background. They, they sort of animate you, but anything that's green won't show up. So here's this thing, and it looks like, it looks like one of those, you know, rodeo kind of things that you're riding in the pubs. But it was on a giant skateboard. And I was looking at it. And I didn't think it was for me. I just thought it was some of, some of the guys were working out on it or something. And then one of the guys come over and he goes, oh, that's, that's your wag. And 
I was like, what's a, what's a wag? <laughs> and he said, well, it's a, it's a giant wolf that Arzog's going to be riding in the film. And so Peter Jackson came and he goes, hey, buddy, yeah, get, get on your wag. <laughs> so, so I like, climb up on top of this thing, right? I'm, I'm like, sitting up, I'm, I'm honestly sitting on something that just looks like this. And Peter started going into the scene and he's going, okay, look, the thing is, is you're riding your wag down this hill into a forest of giant trees. And as you come in, you know, <laughs> as you come in, there's going to be like Thor and Oak and Shield and, and you know, the, uh, the Gandalf and all the, all, the, all the dwarves are going to be up in this tree. And you know they're there because he can smell them. So this, this next line, the, this line that you deliver, it's like, you know, you're going to sort of deliver this line off to your fellow walks, because the line means, you know, it means in black speech, can you smell their fear? So. <laughs> little gimpy outfit on. And then I went, oh, Peter, wait, 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 wait. Is, like, this wag, is this wag here, like, is it my special wag? Like, does, does Arzog have his own wag? And he went, yeah, your wag's, like, white. It's a, it's a white wag. Everybody else's wags are, like, gray or black, but yours is white, because you're the pale orc, so you've got a pale wag as well. I went, oh, wow. So, like, when I saw this wag the first time, I was like, wow, it's a white orc, and I'm a, a white wag, and I'm a white orc. Like, that's cool. Like, do I think, like, did I have this walk when I was a puppy? Sorry, this, this wag? Did I have this wag when I was little? Like, have I raised it? Do I have this, um, do I have a brother? Like, can I have a relationship with my wag? And Peter Jackson, honestly, was just standing. He came out from behind his control panel. And he went, uh, what? Come on, look, I think I can build some stuff into this, honestly. Because I mean, you're, like, you're sitting there, and like, I never refer to this thing as anything but a green pommel horse. <laughs> but if it's my work, I can relate to it. <laughs> so I said, Pete, look, there was, there was nothing in front of me, like, just put the pommel horse was here and here. And I said, so it's heads out here, is it? It's like it's got a big head. And he said, yeah, yeah, it's got, like, its head, like, right out there. And I'm like, oh, great, okay, so can I, can I, Instead of yelling, like saying to these guys, can you smell the fear, guys? Yeah. Can I lean down into my wag <laughs> and stroke its hair <laughs> and say, Abakti Umna? And that's what's in the film, you know? And I loved, I, I loved it because all of a sudden there was relationship, you know, and I think relationship is key to, to, to drawing any emotion from any scene in any, in any, in any scene, you know? Uh, so so that, was, that, was, that was something that was really interesting. And one other thing you were saying, the expressions, you know, like there was one other thing when I was on the back of the wag. Um, I guess I don't look like I'm on a wag now, do I? So I, I was on the back of my wag and, uh, and Peter Jackson went, Okay, Thorin's coming down, the battle's on, he's coming down. I remember him coming down, and, and again, I'm in the gimp suit. It's like, hey, hey. <laughs> Come on, Thorin. No, I had, and I had to get out of that mindset. I had to go, right. And so he came down, and I, and I, remember, I remember just sitting there. And I, I did what Maori call a pukana. I'm a New Zealand Maori, you know, I'm, I'm from New Zealand and the native people there are called Maori, so I'm part Maori, so they do this thing called a pukana, which is your eyes go right back, and usually you stick out your tongue, but I didn't know how his tongue would work, because he had sharp teeth, so. But, so, uh, so yeah, and I said, Pete, did you see I did a pukana? And he was like, yeah, I saw that, and I said, can we use that? He said, yeah, yeah, we'll see, we'll see. But in the movie, you'll see that when, when Thorne starts coming down that tree toward me, you know, there's this poo kind of. 
And Peter said to me, he said to me, like the Andy Circus established this as well, that when you're in, when you're doing motion capture, the most important thing is to get the soul of the character, and you can get that through the eyes. It's the way your eyes move, you know. There's a, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a there's an art to it. And you can only find out once you do the process. Yeah. Okay. I was wondering if you could explain some of the fight scenes between you and Steven. Oh, you know, it's it's just like any production where, you know, you have stunt coordinators that call you into a room a couple of weeks before the episode you'd be doing and I say, okay, this is what the fight sequence is. And so you learn it like a piece of choreography. Uh, you know, we on this show as well, like I'm on Spartacus, I did everything. Uh, because in New Zealand there's no, there's no, you can't sue in the workplace. <laughs> it's true, we, we have this um, system called ACC, whereas if you, get, if you get injured, the government pays for your medical costs. And, uh, you know, if you get your hand cut off, in an industrial job, right? Oh, okay. You'll be off work for two weeks. You'll take 500 bucks. <laughs> I'm telling you, it's a long way down south, New Zealand. Uh, we still have ships with sails on them. But, um, yeah, basically, uh, you, you know, he, he, in America and Canada, the, uh, the legalities are, are completely different. Uh, so when it comes down, to, the unions are very strong as well. So, so when it comes down to stunt scenes, stunt guys do it. If it's regarded as a stunt element, a stunt guy steps in. But you know, my, my stunt coordinator said something to me that, that made a lot of sense because I was, I was like, what? I did all my fights in Spartacus. I want to do it all. I don't want some guy representing my physical. You know, I want to get in there and throw the kitchen sink. You know, and. Uh, and, no, and, and he said to me, well, Mano, you know, that's, that might be the situation in New Zealand, but, uh, but here, in, uh, here in Canada or in America, you'll find that the stunt unions are very strong. And uh, the reason why we get our boys to come in is because, just like you learned how to do acting, they learned how to do stunt work. And they did that so they could get a job in a stunt industry. And so when they come to a production like this, and there's a stunt fight, that's their job. And if you take it, they don't get that job and they don't take their food home to their families and put on the tables. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. James, you do all my stunts, brother. <laughs> Go feed your baby. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a good point. It's a good point. But, uh, you know, so it's a little bit, little bit different doing Arrow because, uh, yeah, you know, a lot of our great stunt guys do all the, do, do all the fighting. But, uh, but, you know, I still get to do all of the great slave balls and moments, you know. <laughs> nice to finally meet you, kid. <laughs> <laughs> if Slate Wilson had a theme song, what would it be? <laughs> and welcome to Arizona Weather. <laughs> Here I am on my little island <laughs> Waiting for my queen You know who I mean
trained and drilled and they're about to go put their lives on the line, you know. So that was a very confronting moment. Uh, you know, it was, it, was, it was hugely flattering that uh, a lot of the military uh, regard our show as something very motivational and, they, and a, lot of the, a lot of the units watch our show before they go out and be deployed because they're looking for some kind of inspiration, something to motivate them. And Spartacus was very popular with the uh, military. Um, now, when I was there, I became friends with the, uh, some of the Special Forces guys. And I would, I would, I would, in, in the morning, they'd come with our bus and, and like there's two support vehicles, one with the driver, the head, and one with the driver, the channel, and they'd drive like, the one behind would have his nose right on the end of the bus doing like 140 kilometers an hour, you know, like 80, 90 miles an hour. Just, and I, I was driving with those guys. I was with the Special Forces guys in the other car. After I left Kuwait, they issued a letter saying that Celebrities were never allowed to <laughs> ride in the cars again. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but, you know, I was hanging out with these guys and, and, you know, I got some stories from them, you know, I was just really interested in, in, in what they went through. And, uh, but one of the guys taught me, you know, a chokehold. And um, I went down to Los Angeles from Kuwait and, uh, and I went to this audition for, for Amber. And, you know, when I was sitting in the audition room, Read cold, it was a cold read, so I didn't get the script until I walked in. And it said, it, Slade Wilson's name on the script was Holloway. It just had Holloway. And it said, Holloway jumps down from the air, drop, jumps, drops between the aeroplane fuselage and lands on the top of Oliver, pulling a blade and putting it to his throat. Grabs him in a chokehold. And I'm like, oh, wow, it's that chokehold. These guys told me that. So, so you know, I, I walked in. I, I could hear all these guys reading the lines before I went in there. And, I, and one thing that sort of bothered me was that I could hear the acting. I could really hear the acting, you know. You tell me something, kid, or I'm going to cut out your throat box. <laughs> or just guys who were right over the top. There's a couple of guys in there that were so funny. <laughs> I'm going to cut out your throat box. <laughs> And I don't know, it was kind of freaking me out. But I was just trying to hone something that, that I thought would be really kind of like, I haven't hung with these guys in Kuwait. I just was thinking, like, what would these guys be like, you know? And, I, and, and so I went in there and, and there was a guy standing behind the camera who was going to read. And, and I said, can he come in front of the camera with me? Because um, I'd like to have him in position. So I'm like going through the actual scene. And so the director was like, oh, you might. And the young kid came forward. <laughs> I can see where this is going. And I was wanting to make this very real. <laughs> so I grabbed I grabbed this kid around the around the neck in this chokehold these guys had taught me in Kuwait. And I started squeezing. But I, but I didn't think I was squeezing, I just thought I was holding it off enough and I, and I went, You got ten seconds to tell me something I believe, kid. I'm gonna cut out your throat box. And at that moment, he went limp. <laughs> and, and he dropped onto the floor, <laughs> unconscious. <laughs> and I looked at the director, and I didn't realize he passed out at first. And I went, Is it, did I miss something? Is this part of the scene? <laughs> And the director was like, no, I think you choked him out. So I go, <laughs> before you ring the cops. Um, and the guy said, no, 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 no. He said, he said, look, listen, he told the guy to go wash his face. And I was like, look, I'm, I'm uh, you know, I'm sorry, man. I, I just got back from Kuwait. <laughs> anyway, no, don't apologize, because it was perfect. <laughs> and then I went, and they said, come here, come here, come here. And we, I walked around the camera, and we both watched it. And, the, and, and we were watching it, and you could see the eyes, the guys, eyes roll back. And, like, <laughs> and the casting director was laughing, and he said, this has never happened as a classic. This is hilarious. <laughs> I love this. 
Anyway, uh, yeah, so... Um, Is it on uh, YouTube? <laughs> it's, you know what, I wish it would show up somewhere, because it's, it's, around, it's around somewhere, it's on tape somewhere. <laughs> Hopefully it'll pop up one day, because just to have it there, it, it's, it'd be quite fun. But, uh, but yeah, that's, that's, how I, that's how I got the role.
And so one of my mates dated one of the girls that went there and I dated this other girl. So I was a jet and he was a shark. And, you know, we did that whole musical. And then I got sort of dragged into it more. But what you learn dancing is you learn the, sp the, the movement is relative to a viewer. You know, so your lines and the way that, you know, I mean, you, you, you jump all over the place and do all your moves and your dancing, but it's all meant to be choreographed in a way that it's aesthetically pleasing to a viewer. So when I started working as an actor, I realized that that viewer is the camera. And so my performance is metered physically in a way that sort of suits the way that I can imagine it being on that frame. And that's, it's an awareness that I think is a, is, a, is a bonus, you know, than just being a person who sort of has no movement experience and just gets in front of a camera. Because there's a lot of heavy, uh, you know, footed actors that I work with who don't have movement skills. And when they're static in a scene, the scene doesn't move. So I tend to move around to, to get them into a flow. And they're usually going like <laughs> this or whatever. But, but it, it livens the scene. But anyway, so, so when it came down to making things that would work on the camera as an impact for the viewer, you know, we were just making these things up, and that was one of the ones that I made up. And I could do it, and I could do it in a way where my foot wouldn't hit the camera and smack the poor cameraman in the face. I was aware of sort of spatial distance as a dancer as well. So, you know, it's little things like that that work and just end up being a little trademark, yeah. And then when I went down to The Hobbit, you know, the opportunity came to, to do a couple of moves, and I'm like, well, what about this one? I do it in Spartacus all the time. Yeah, yeah, we'll do that one as well. You know? and I think I've done it with Slade a couple of times. Yeah. But, but thanks for acknowledging that movement. Yeah, because it was a good movie. It was an amazing movie. You look familiar. So, I'm a pretty big Deathstroke fan. <laughs> <laughs> and I love your portrayal of Slade Wilson on air has been incredible. Um, I love the way the character was adapted and, and interpreted for that show and that environment. Um, my question is, how much of that interpretation is you? Did they give you a lot of freedom to kind of work within that character, or, or were there a lot of more stringent guidelines for you? At the end of the day, when you go to a casting and there's like a thousand guys going for the same role, it's you who, who gets the role. You know, you've got to, you've got to meter it. It's like a, it's, it's I, you know, I see acting or dancing, or anything, or anything that's artistic as being just a language. You know, you've got to meet a, you know, somebody said to me, you know, how can you sound so, you know, threatening? Like, you scare the hell out of me when you perform. And it's, it's, it's like, it's like playing the piano, you know, sometimes, you know, I mean, it doesn't, you don't have to be a big guy to play Rachmaninoff. You just have to have the feeling. Then you have to transmute that feeling into the piano, so that sound comes out and people listening are like, oh, it's intense, it's intense, whoa. You know, we can touch it lightly and people will just sort of close their eyes and you don't have to be, you don't have to be in any physical form, you just have to actually transfer that energy. So with me, it's just about finding that chord, finding that tone that suddenly elaborates a moment in hard strength, fury, drama, or soft, delicate, you know, it's, 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 it's a metering. And when you're an actor, that's, that's, I think that, you know, that's one of the things that I'm learning mostly is, is you know, that metering is what really helps build more of your ability to, to meter anything, you know? Um, just get the music right, you know, in a way, yeah. So. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. I thought there was something else. Yes, I mean. Uh, my name is Miguel Robles, and I'm just questioning. Uh, I had a question for you about one of your past movies that you made. Um, how is it working with John Cena and Robert Robert Patrick on the Marine? John Cena punched me right in the face <laughs> in one of the scenes, and I had to go to the hospital for soft um, trauma to, um, damage in my my forearm from doing this block over and over again this overhand punch. The guy is just made of like steel. He's, 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 like, a, he's like fighting a silverback gorilla. <laughs> you know, like really, he's that big. And, uh, and when, you, when you, when him and I were pretty committed to doing the fighting scenes, you know, like, you know, you've heard my approach and he has the same approach. 
And uh, so when the two of us started going at it, he was lucky because he, he got to do a block like that, which means that the bone on his forearm was, was his shield. And I was coming down with an over, over the top thing where the soft tissue of my forearm was connecting with his bone. So he had the advantage, but we we're both putting as much energy into it. And we did this scene over and over and over. And I was going to the director, I said, listen, mate, honestly, we, my, my arm was getting really sore. And he was like, well, we're only a couple more times. We've got to get a couple more c coverage angles. By the time we got to the end, my, I couldn't feel my arm and, my, and it started to, it went purple and it puffed right up. And they took me to a hospital because they weren't quite sure what was wrong with it. And I got there and it was like soft tissue trauma. And they said, you're going to have to have four days off work. I was on set the next day fighting him again. <laughs> These, these things that happen now. So, but but John was fantastic. I mean, fantastic guy. I mean, just amazingly, amazingly nice guy. He'd rap in the car and do it. He, funny guy, nice guy, great guy to work with. Um, uh, Robert Patrick, of course, you know. I mean, to, to me, like the Terminator. You know, it's like oh. Uh, I, I've done a couple of. Uh, I did a convention with him. It was a funny story. We did one in Tampa Bay, Florida. I don't know who these guys were that organized this convention, but there was like 10 people there. The whole weekend, me and Robert Patrick signed four autographs each. And somebody lost their house because they had to pay us out, you know. And they did. And I was like, oh my God, these guys, how did they make this mistake, you know? But anyway, uh, but, but yeah, yeah, it's, it's been interesting seeing Robert because, uh, you know, he's, he's just such a great actor and I, and I, and I respect him a lot. So what I work with him on that, on that movie, uh, it was it was funny because uh, you know uh, I came up with that line because uh, I was shooting at John Cena's car and I came up, I said to the director can I turn around and go this guy's like the freaking Terminator <laughs> <laughs> and, he went, oh, so, and, he, and then Robert Patrick looks up into the into the rear vision mirror and they used it it was quite funny. <laughs> I was just, I was, I was just in New Zealand last weekend doing a convention there in my home country, and and there was there was a lady who had a store there, and they printed this shirt off, and I went, have you got one? And they'd sort of sold out of them all, and then she came back with this one, which I think was a girl's shirt. <laughs> but it fit. But it fit. Yeah, no, yeah, it's a, yeah, yeah. yeah. I know. I've been waiting for a really for a good Deathstroke shirt to come out, and. Uh, because you know, people are picking up all these, all the artists out on Artist Alley are starting to draw death strokes and they're starting to pop up all these different variations. So it was great to be able to you know, bring a character back to life and so all the comic book guys are actually doing it again. But uh, you know, there's some really good drawings coming out, but t-shirt wise, yeah, there's still a, I was waiting for the black one that's just got the, the half orange, you know, as I was staring through the dark, you know. But the, they'll start coming, any t-shirt makers out there, get to work. and had a chance to meet you that I think you were one of the sweetest, kindest people I've ever seen with fans. Oh, come on, come on, I'll talk it out. <laughs> Not everyone is going to get that treatment. Okay. <laughs> hey, how's it going? Yeah, I'm good. Man. Uh, I, I kind of want a hook now, but uh... <laughs> um, so you were in all seasons of Spartacus, every single season, and uh, the cast kind of became somewhat of a family, of, for what I see. How was it going to Arrow and running into Cynthia Dia Robinson and Katrina Law for Arrow? Yeah, you know, uh, I mean, the only unfortunate thing about that is that they weren't shooting in any scenes that I was in. And on, just for some reason, on some of the occasions, I was, uh, I was flying out when they were flying in. And so I, I, caught, I caught up with a Cynthia only once in, in Vancouver. Yeah, and, uh, and Katrina, like, maybe twice. You know, just uh, our schedules. Because, I mean, I film and then I go off and do conventions or do some other stuff. We're going to do some or whatever. 
So yeah, just just in the busy schedule, I didn't get to spend much time with them up there. But but I mean, yeah, it's it's. I I figured, I figured CW realised that we could pull some audience over to them, <laughs> and there was a there was a, a, a general consensus as well that these girls had been really tough operators in another show and, and proven themselves. So. Yeah, there was something about the flavour, I think, that, that they knew would be kind of cool, you know? And it's nice to know that as, that as actors, you know, we can, we can move into other projects and, and, you know, fellow actors can come along and be there and people won't go, oh, that's a bit odd, you know? But it really comes down to how, how good, I mean, if you think about it, Amanda Waller and Cynthia are really a great, she's a really great casting choice for that, it's perfect, you know, perfect. And Katrina is like, you know, she's, she has this, She's part Chinese, you know, and uh, seeing that whole role is just, and she's so beautiful, you know, the whole role, she just owns it. So, so I mean, everybody deserved their roles in this show, and, and it's only by byproduct that we were as part of this people. But it's nice that they they did that and didn't think twice about, well, you know, they're from Spartacus, so we can't cast them. You know what I mean? Yeah, those girls are tough girls, they deserve their roles. <clears throat> Good work, mate. Thanks for that. But now the woman who I was in love with is trying to kill me with a missile. <laughs> Navia. <laughs> What's with the missiles? <laughs> uh, hi. Uh, I loved what you did with Deathstroke and Arrow and everything, but my question was more towards Spartacus, because you mentioned that you did all the stunts and all the fighting, you got to do all the really cool stuff in Spartacus, but I was wondering, did you and any of the other actors like ever like rough house or like spar together, like off camera, like just like, hey, let's see who can do this the best? Or... Oh, on camera. <laughs> what are you talking about? We were, we, we were like, honestly, we were regulars down at the local a and &E. You know, we were, we, I'd walk in the door and I'd go, hey, hey Mo, what'd you do this time? I go, ah, oh, I don't know, broken finger, I think. Or, you know, four busted ribs. I broke four ribs in a scene. And uh, I, I, in another scene, I'd, I'd done my intercostals once. And I knew how painful that was. You know, intercostals suck, you know what I mean? You know, if you cough or you laugh or anything like that, it just, it just kills. And it takes, it takes you know, a couple of weeks to, to really go away. And uh, so on one scene, I was doing a scene with Gannicus, and I was uh, basically tackling him. Gannicus! Yeah! <laughs> Uh, and I was tackling him, and uh, there was a phantom shot. Phantom is where they go into that super slow motion. And so I thought, if I'm tackling him, I'm just going to pick him up like a real football or rugby tackle, and I'm going to just throw him through the air, you know. And so this whole thing will look like, <laughs> you know, the way we hit the dirt as well. They usually turn the camera angle around you, hitting the dirt right in front of the camera. I just knew what the shot would look like. So I said to the stunt guy, I'm just going to, because the stunt guy came in, not, not Dustin. I said, mate, I'm going to hit you so hard, mate. Okay, is that okay? Because I'm just going to come in like full on. And he was like, oh, yeah, yeah, our stunt guys were great. Everyone put their body on. And in Canada, you wouldn't get away with it. You wouldn't. You simply wouldn't. And so I ran up this guy full speed, punched him into the air, you know, just went sailing through midair and just landed like. And when I landed, I noticed that his knee had stayed bent. And I could see it bent, and I went, oh shit. <laughs> and, and it went straight to my ribs, and I was like, oh. And I got up, and I was, I was like, oh, and I, oh. And they came over, and I said, you okay? I said, oh, it's just, oh. <laughs> no, I think it's my, oh, I think I did my intercostals again. And they were like, oh, you know, are you okay? And I went, oh. Wait up. Oh. Okay, 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 wait up. Okay, okay. Just can we do it again? I went, oh. <laughs> ah, okay, okay, okay. So I'm running the scope. Yeah. Ah. Anyway, I, I continued fighting for about another five days and then we jumped on planes and we came across to do San Diego Comic Con last month that, that year. And when I was on the plane, I almost. Couldn't, so I almost stopped breathing. I was on the plane and I was like, oh. and I was like, and I had to keep on getting water and I had to, and I asked the lady for an ice pack and they, they brought me out of ice and, and, uh, and 
and then I got off the plane and we did San Diego Comic Con and I had heaps of pain and I went back and I got back to New Zealand on the plane back I had the same thing and I got back to New Zealand and I, went, and I said, guys, this is ridiculous, this is like, this is not healing. And so they sent me to the, to the hospital and uh, we got x-rays and they said, you've got four broken ribs. <laughs> And I went back and I said, and I went to the stunt guys and I went, I got four broken ribs. <laughs> and it kind of went down as a kind of like a, you know, like I, the, the stunt guys were really, you know, really, really complimentary with me, you know, I mean, because they knew that I put it on the line and, and, and they put it on the line. We, we were like this, we were really like a band of brothers that really threw everything at Spartacus. I mean, you know, who's a Spartacus fan out there? Good, you know what? Yeah, you should be, you know, because it was such a great show that was so committed. And I say that for all the people that I worked with because they really did such an amazing job. You know, that was just really a, the trip of my life was, was getting on that show and going through that experience. Um, but now it's back to Arrow. And, uh, yeah, hopefully that'll continue. Who's, who's the next? Teach you. Teach me? And you. And you. And you. And the guy up the back there. Whoever put their hands up, up here now. If you put your hand up, get up. Or if you want to come up, come up. It's better in numbers. If you fancy yourself as being somebody who can give it a good grunt, then get up here now. If you have a costume on, get up here now. If you're a man, get up here now. If you're a woman who wants to stand next to men while they, while they slap their legs and make loud animal noises, get up here now. Okay. Now, the first thing about the hucker. The first thing about the hucker you have to understand is we're a tribe and we love each other. And we're defending our, our kids, we're defending our land, we're defending our honor, we're defending generation upon generation of warrior that stood before us. So at this moment, you're not standing here alone as an individual, you're standing here as a collaboration of force that represents our tribe as one. Do you know what I mean? Now, the haka begins with going down on your legs in a stance like this. Now what you're doing is that you're checking out your opponents who are standing there in front of you, and this is a challenge. Now the thing is you have to start slapping your legs as hard as you can with both hands. Now you're, if you do this properly, you should end up with blood blisters on your legs. Seriously. Now, follow after me. The words go like this. Kamate, kamate. Kora, kora. Kamate, kamate. Kora, kora. It means, am I going to die or am I going to live?